Hello and welcome to Folklore of the Universe, the podcast which is now officially 10 years old. In podcast years, not human years. I'm your host, Kyle. This is episode 28. This is also the podcast's one year anniversary. So it's a year old. Well, it will be in two days. The first episode I ever did was on January 19th. Seps so coming right up, but for all intents and purposes, this is the one year anniversary, so we did it. Holy shit. I really had no idea what I was really doing or getting into back when I started. It's like, if it's got any better, that's because I had no clue what I was what I was actually doing at first, and I learned as I went. But it's evolved quite a bit since then. We've got more music during the stories now, we've got Monsters of the Week. Hopefully it'll continue to evolve and be better next year. Assuming I'm still doing it next year, I hopefully I think I should be. Unless there's like a catastrophic changing event to that. But that's not that's not on the agenda, so yeah, it's gonna keep going, and it's been it's been going good. I had a lot of fun doing it over this past year. So yeah. Also it's 2020 now, which is really weird because I've always thought of this as like the future years. Like the 20 teens, those were like near future, you know, those were coming up on the list, but 2020, this is like the solid future. It uh, still sucks, hasn't changed, but that's whatever. So, because it's just been the new year, we can talk a little bit about New Year's in general, um, and all that. And then we're gonna do our Monster of the Week. And then, because this is the one year anniversary, the first episode ever, I did two Grimm stories. And for this one, I'm gonna do two more Grimm stories. So that's on the docket. And then uh, next episode will just be a regular one. I've got some fun stories picked out for that already too, so look forward to that. But for now, let's talk about New Year's's. New Year's Year's is the technical term. Really, I'm just going to be talking about the New Year's in the Western world, which we just had, because other calendars have their own days set out for the New Year's, but we've got ours now. And that's what just happened, so that's what I'm going to talk about. And if you're like me, you've probably wondered why the shit is New Year's on a random day in the middle of winter. Like, it doesn't line up with any of the seasons, it doesn't even line up with the solstices that well. Like, winter solstice at least would have kind of made sense. But it's just sort of on a random ass day. As it turns out, like many things, it comes from the Romans. So they mucked it all up for us. It comes from uh, their calendar, which is the Julian calendar, named after Julius Caesar. And they basically had all the same months as us, so our January comes from Januarius, which is the first month in the Julian calendar. Then they also had other months like Februarius, Martius, Aprilius, so you can see it's basically all the same names as we have now, just Latinized vacations. It's a technical term there. But Januarius took its name from Janus, literally means the month of Janus, who is one of the Roman gods. And Janus was the god of, get ready for this, beginnings, openings, passages, gates, and doorways. And he's always depicted as having two heads, one which looks into the future, one which looks into the past, facing opposite ways. So you can see where we're going with this. He's the god of beginnings, so his month is the start of the year. The boundary between the past and the future, that's what the new year is. I mean, that's what every day is, but this is, we've got society structure thoughts around this, so this is more so. This all explains why January is the first month and where that came from, but doesn't really explain why it's the first month at this time of the year, why it's in the middle of winter but not quite on the winter solstice and not in one of the other equinoxes like the start of spring or anything like that, so I'm going to explain that now. But it basically boils down to the Roman calendar was really fucky for a long time and drifted around. Originally, way back when, the start of the year was on the spring equinox, which makes a lot of sense. The day of spring equal day and night time is a good day to start the year. It makes sense astronomy-wise, makes sense mood-wise. You know, it's getting warmer and lighter out from there on out. So it's a good one to do, but obviously that didn't hold. Because originally, the Roman calendar was also tied to the lunar cycle, which lasts 10 months long. So you can see the problem where the lunar cycle doesn't match up with the solar cycle for months. So what they would do to try and force it to keep matching up is that they would either add in leap months or they would just have entire strings of days that had no month assigned to them. So you can see that things got really messy really quickly, especially because this depended on who held political power and Rome was corrupt as hell. So when the Julian calendar came around and they finally solidified things, 
they set it in stone and dropped the whole lunar calendar thing, but also didn't bother to line it back up with the equinoxes, which is why it's a little messed up. Then also they had leap years slightly wrong, so the things got more messed up. So by the time the Gregorian calendar, which is the one we use now, was fully settled, it was a little bit off from the equinoxes and solstices by about, well, what is it, 10 days or so off from the start of the year. And then, in a, then the other equinoxes are in like the middle of the month or slightly towards the end of the month, in the 20th, the 21st, 22nd. So you can, the whole thing has just got a bit messed up through all that. But there you have it, the rather unglamorous reason we celebrate the New Year's on January 1st, because of the Romans being bullshit with their calendars. So there we go, that's where that came from. That is, that's a bit of a mess, but we're going to move on now to our Monster of the Week, something with a little more order and sanity than the Roman calendar system. Which isn't hard, but hey, gotta do what you gotta do. Anyways, this episode, our Monster of the Week, is from Chinese folklore. This is called the Nian. The word Nian literally means year or new year, so you can see where the tie-in is here, where I'm going with this. Appearance-wise, accounts differ for what it looks like. Some people say that it resembles a lion with a dog's body and a big incisors. Some people say it's larger than an elephant with two long horns and lots of sharp teeth. So there's a variety of different appearance descriptions for this, but what it does is pretty consistent across the board. The Nian spends most of its time sleeping, relatable, and it wakes up at the start of every year on the Chinese New Year, and it just starts eating stuff because food is sparse, so it goes into the villages and starts eating crops and livestock and children. And this is during New Year, during winter, so this is especially harsh because it's winter time and food is scarce as it is. But it does have some weaknesses. In the end, it's afraid of fire, it's afraid of loud noises, and it's afraid of the color red, according to tradition. So this is why on Chinese New Year, a lot of the celebrations involve setting off fireworks and firecrackers, having big, loud celebrations and parties, and also why the color red is so prominent. It's all to scare off the Nian. And as always, it's really hard to tell whether the Nian came first and these celebrations came around that tradition to scare it away, or the Nian was a way of explaining why these things were done to celebrate the New Year's. Or it could be both at the same time, who knows. So pretty neat traditions. I really like the aesthetic of the monster who sleeps most of the time, then wakes up to cause trouble. Normally it's for like, you know, a thousand years before it wakes up, but one year is fine too. Now though, it's time to move on to our folk stories. And like I said before, this episode we're going to do another two Grimm's fairy tales. This first story is called The Wolf and the Seven Little Kids. There was once upon a time an old goat who had seven little kids and loved them with all the love of a mother for her children. One day, she wanted to go into the forest and fetch some food, so she called all seven to her and said, Dear children, I have to go into the forest. Be on your guard against the wolf. If he comes in, he will devour you all, skin, hair, and all. The wretch often disguises himself, but you will know him at once by his rough voice and his black feet. The kids said, Dear mother, we will take good care of ourselves. You may go away without any anxiety. Then the old one bleated and went on her way with an easy mind. It was not long before someone knocked at the door and called, Open the door, dear children. Your mother is here and has brought something back with her for each of you. But the little kids knew that it was the wolf by the rough voice. We will not open the door, cried they. You are not our mother. She has a soft, pleasant voice. Your voice is rough. You are the wolf. Then the wolf went away to a shopkeeper and bought himself a great lump of chalk, ate this, and made his voice soft with it. Then he came back, knocked at the door of the house, and cried, Open the door, dear children. Your mother is here, and has brought something back with her for each of you. But the wolf had laid his black paws against the window, and the children saw them and cried, we will not open the door. Our mother is not black feet like you. You are the wolf. Then the wolf ran to a baker and said, I have hurt my feet. Rub some dough over them for me. And when the baker had rubbed his feet over, he ran to the miller and said, Strew some white meal over my feet for me. The miller thought to himself, The wolf wants to deceive someone, and refused. But the wolf said, If you will not do it, I will devour you. Then the miller was afraid, and made his paws white for him. Yes, that's how people are. So now the wretch went for the third time to the door, knocked at it, and said, 
Open the door for me, children. Your dear little mother has come home and has brought every one of you something back from the forest with her. The little kids cried, First show us your paws, that we may know if you are a dear little mother. Then he put his paws in through the window, and when the kids saw that they were white, they believed that all he had said was true, and opened the door. But who should come in but the wolf? They were terrified, and wanted to hide themselves. One sprang under the table, the second into the bed, the third into the stove, the fourth into the kitchen, the fifth into the cupboard, the sixth under the washing bowl, and the seventh into the clock case. But the wolf found them, and used no great ceremony. One after the other, he swallowed them down his throat. The youngest, who was in the clock case, was the only one he did not find. When the wolf had satisfied his appetite, he took himself off, laid himself down under a tree in the green meadow outside, and began to sleep. Soon afterwards, the old goat came home again from the forest. Ah, what a sight she saw there! The door stood wide open. The table, chairs, and benches were thrown down. The washing bowl lay broken into pieces, and the quilts and pillows were pulled off the bed. She sought her children, but they were nowhere to be found. She called them one after another by name, but no one answered. At last, when she came to the youngest, a soft voice cried, Dear mother, I am in the clock case. She took the kid out, and it told her that the wolf had come and eaten all the others. Then you may imagine how she wept over her poor children. At last in her grief she went out, and the youngest kid ran with her. When they came to the meadow, there the wolf lay by the tree and snored so loud that the branches shook. She looked at him on every side, saw that something was moving and struggling in his gorged belly. Ah oh, heavens, said she, is it possible that my poor children, whom he has swallowed down for his supper, can still be alive? Then the kid had to run home and fetch scissors, and a needle and thread, and the goat cut open the monster's stomach, and hardly had she made one cut, than one little kid thrust its head out, and when she cut further, all six sprang out one after another, and were all still alive, and had suffered no injury whatever, for in his greediness, the monster had swallowed them down whole. What rejoicing there was! They embraced their dear mother, and jumped like a sailor at his wedding. The mother, however, said, now go look for some big stones. We will fill the wicked beast's stomach with them while he is still asleep. Then the seven kids dragged the stones there with all speed, and put as many of them into his stomach as they could get in. And the mother sewed him up again in the greatest haste, so that he was not aware of anything, and never once stirred. When the wolf at length had had his sleep out, he got on his legs, and as the stones in his stomach made him very thirsty, he wanted to go to a well to drink. But when he began to walk and move about, the stones in his stomach knocked against each other and rattled. Then cried he, What rambles and tumbles against my poor bones? I thought it was six kids, but it's not but big stones. And when he got to the well and stooped over the water and was just about to drink, the heavy stones made him fall in, and there was no help, but he had to drown miserably. When the seven kids saw that, they came running to the spot and cried aloud, The wolf is dead! The wolf is dead! And danced for joy round the well with their mother. The End This is one of those stories that's got a really obvious moral message, especially when you consider that these messages are often aimed at kids, back when these were told. There's a pretty strong, uh, don't let strangers into your home because they will eat you, or worse, message here, which is good advice. You should not let random strangers into your home, especially if they are planning to eat you, or worse. So top tip there from the Grimm brothers. But at least the kids were kind of smart about it. Like, they didn't let the stranger in until the stranger had fooled them sufficiently. Although, then, you know, the third time he tried to get in, you'd think they'd be, maybe we should be a little more careful, you know? Maybe we shouldn't let people in, because you know this wolf's trying to get in. He's tried twice. It's probably him again, right? No? I don't know. They are kids, so maybe they didn't think of that. But it all works out. They get the kids out. They uh, drown the wolf. I think the thing of putting stones in his belly, that's in other stories too, like uh, Little Red Riding Hood. They put the rock in his belly. So sort of a common idea of doing impromptu stone surgery on a wolf. Don't try that at home, people. Let a trusted professional do that operation because it's it can be tricky. One thing I really like about the story is uh, that one sassy little line after the miller uh, puts the wolf's paws all together when the wolf threatens him, that, yes, that's how people are. 
I just really love that it was included, that sort of little jab at people being jerks. Overall, though, this story is fairly standard. This is a somewhat generic fairy tale. You've got the big bad wolf, you've got the children, in this case they're goats, which, you know, it happens. Uh, There's the moral lesson and the message. The youngest kid is the most successful one. Uh, In this one, they get out all right and punish the bad guy. Doesn't always happen, but happened this time. So yeah, fairly cut and dry story, but it's a fun story, and it's got a good message to it. So it's a little generic, but it's good. It's a good one. But now let's move on to our next Grimm's fairy tale, and this one is called The Wonderful Musician. There was once a wonderful musician who went quite alone through a forest and thought of all manner of things, and when nothing was left for him to think about, he said to himself, Time is beginning to pass heavily with me here in the forest. I will fetch a good companion for myself. Then he took his fiddle from his back and played so that it echoed through the trees. It was not long before a wolf came trotting through the thicket towards him. Ah, here is a wolf coming. I have no desire for him, said the musician. But the wolf came nearer and said to him, Ah, dear musician, how beautifully you do play. I should like to learn that too. It is soon learned, the musician replied. Only, you have to do all that I bid you. Oh, musician, said the wolf. I will obey you as a scholar obeys his master. The musician had him follow, and when they'd gone a part of the way together, they came to an old oak tree, which was hollow inside and cleft in the middle. Look, said the musician, if you will learn to fiddle, put your forepaws into this crevice. The wolf obeyed. The musician quickly picked up a stone, and with one blow, wedged his two paws so fast that he was forced to stay there like a prisoner. Stay there until I come back again, said the musician, and went his way. After a while, he again said to himself, Time is beginning to pass heavily with me here in the forest, I will fetch another companion, and took his fiddle, and again played in the forest. It was not long before a fox came creeping through the trees towards him. Ah, there's a fox coming, said the musician, I have no desire for him. The fox came up to him and said, Oh dear musician, how beautifully you do play. I should like to learn that too. That is soon learned, said the musician. You have only to do everything that I bid you. Oh musician, then said the fox, I will obey you as a scholar obeys his master. Follow me, said the musician, and when they had walked part of the way, they came to a footpath with high bushes on both sides of it. There the musician stood still, and from one side bent a young hazel bush down to the ground and put his foot on top of it. Then he bent down a young tree from the other side as well and said, Now little fox, if you will learn something, give me your left front paw. The fox obeyed, and the musician fastened his paw to the left bow. Little fox, said he, now reach me with your right paw, and he tied it to the right bow. When he had examined whether they were firm enough, he let go, and the bushes sprang up again and jerked up the little fox so that it hung struggling in the air. Wait there until I come back again, said the musician, and went his way. Again, he said to himself, Time is beginning to pass heavily with me here in the forest. I will fetch another companion. So, he took his fiddle, and the sound echoed through the trees. Then, a little hare came springing towards him. Why, a hare is coming, said the musician. I do not want him. Ah, dear musician, said the hare, how beautifully you do fiddle. I too should like to learn that. That is soon learned, said the musician. You have only to do everything that I bid you. Oh, musician, replied the little hare, I will obey you as a scholar obeys his master. They went a part of the way together until they came to an open space in the forest, where stood an aspen tree. The musician tied a long string round the little hare's neck, the other end of which he fastened to the tree. No briskly, little hare, run twenty times round the tree, cried the musician, and the little hare obeyed, and when it had run twenty times, it had twisted the string twenty times round the trunk of the tree, and the little hare was caught, and let it pull and tug as it liked, it only made the string cut into its tender neck. Wait there until I come back, said the musician, and went onwards. 
The wolf, in the meantime, had pushed and pulled and bitten at the stone, and had worked so long that he had set his feet free and had drawn them once more out of the cleft. Full of anger and rage, he hurried after the musician and wanted to tear him to pieces. When the fox saw him running, he began to lament and cried with all his might, Brother wolf, come to my help. The musician has betrayed me. The wolf drew down the little tree, bit the cord in two, and freed the fox, who went with him to take revenge on the musician. They found the tied-up hare, whom likewise they released, and then they all sought the enemy together. The musician had once more played his fiddle as he went on his way, and this time he had been more fortunate. The sound reached the ears of a poor woodcutter, who instantly, without a thought, gave up his work and came with his hatchet under his arm to listen to the music. At last comes the right companion, said the musician, for I was seeking a human being and no wild beast. And he began and played so beautifully and delightfully that the poor man stood there as if bewitched, and his heart leapt with gladness. And as he thus stood, the wolf, the fox, and the hare came up, and he saw well that they had some evil design. So he raised his glittering axe and placed himself before the musician, as if to say, Whoever wishes to touch him, beware, for he will have to deal with me. Then the beasts were terrified and ran back into the forest. The musician, however, played once more to the man out of gratitude, and then went onwards. The End this, boys and girls, is a story about racism. No, it is, because he does this thing, he tries to lure people in, right, and he lures in all these animals, and then traps them in these, like, Machiavellian saw stuff, all because, you know, he wants to hang out with the human, doesn't want to hang out with these animals, but that's entrapment. That is literally the definition of entrapment. That is illegal and a hate crime, because you're in the forest. What the fuck do you think is going to come walking up to you? Like, Joe Biden? He doesn't live out there. Animals live out there. Of course animals are going to come up to you if you start playing music. So I, did, I, think, I think he's supposed to be the good guy in this story, but I don't see it. The musician is sort of a major dick. I, I, I'm on the wolf's side, and the fox's side, and the hare's side. And to be fair, often uh, wolves are obviously villains in grim stories, and foxes are sort of in the middle. They can be sort of mischievous, but they can be good too. Usually they trick the wolves, so it's weird to see them getting along. But hares? Hares aren't bad guys. Hares are good guys, so I don't know why he is a jerk to the hare, too. Even from the original story perspective, I don't know what the deal is with that. But still a very strong pro-human bias here. Because the woodsmen, and the woodsmen and the wolf, they've got history, too. Like, we all know that from Little Red Riding Hood. So it just adds extra salt in the wounds. I think it's interesting because it does show how these animals have just reasons for wanting revenge, but then it kind of cuts them off from that. It's, it's like, you know, no, you, you can't, you can't have that. It's a no from me, dog. And I'm not even really sure what the moral or intended message of the story is. Like, it could be a sort of choose your friends wisely type thing, because if you take the wolf as the stock character, as this bad, bad dude, then that factors into it. Like, you don't want to be friends with the main villain. But I don't know if I really agree with screwing people over and trying to kill them just because they wanted to hang out with you. Like, that's not very cool of you. It's not a not a cool move. Maybe the moral is just that musicians are dicks. You know, that could just be it. Maybe even back then, like, the guy who wrote the story was, um, was at a party, and some guy, like, playing some preachy love song on a guitar. An animal house hadn't been made yet, so he didn't think to smash it against the wall. So he was just like, I'm gonna write a story about this asshole and make him look really bad be mean to animals, that'll show them. And then 2,000 years later, we're, we're here now. That worked out, I guess. So if you're at a party and there's some dude with a guitar there, embrace Animal House and smash that shit because you cannot trust him. As far as general story beats go, or thematic structural beats go, uh, there's the rule of threes, of course. You got three animals, and then the woodsman shows up. And you also see it is fairly repetitive for each one. The musician says the same thing before each animal. The animal dialogue with the musician is the same one each time. The only difference is that the animal is trapped differently each time. But you've still got that similarity and repetition, which is common in a lot of these stories, presumably because people used to just have to memorize them before they had writing. So if you've got the same things over and over again, it's easier to remember in the story. 
Overall though, it's still a neat story, but not as fun and wholesome as the previous one, because these animals just wanted to learn music, and they got screwed over for it. I'm afraid though, that's all I've got to talk about for this one, and that's all I've got for the episode, so we'll wrap it up here. So kind of a long one this time, but that's good, because we've got unlimited time anyway, so might as well fill it doing good stuff, unless this drags on for ages and ages and you hate it, in which case, not so great there. But if you did like this, uh, as always, be sure and share it around with all your peeps, your homies, uh, family members, people you see at the laundromat. Just walk up to them and be like, yo, check out this podcast. And there's going to be another one uh, next next two weeks, in the normal time from now again. We've got some fun stories picked out for that one, so that'll be a cool episode. And as always, um, I've been Kyle, this has been the show, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>